join me in prayer. We sing praises to you, God, because you have been gracious to us amid the storms of life. We do battle with many enemies within and among us, but you give us confidence and courage to face them. Out of the whirlwind, you answer when we call. We have gathered to listen for the voice we sometimes cannot hear in the daily clamor of our lives. Help us to discard the excess baggage and unnecessary armor that keeps us from the fullness of life, the life you intend for us. Help us to hear from you today, God. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, and welcome, and always it is great to be with God's people, in God's presence, in God's house on the Lord's day. So welcome, and the invitation of course is to experience and enjoy, and enjoy God's <coughs> presence together. I invite you to be aware of what's happening with regard to this local community of faith. In the um, worship bulletin, there are several announcements that are, that are there. I invite you to look those over and be aware of what's happening uh, in this church. We have our Bible studies on, on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock and Thursday afternoon at 1 o'clock. The 10 o'clock Wednesday study is in the LLC. The Thursday afternoon study is at one o'clock is in the Red Chair Lounge. Also, um, as you know, we have the chapel news uh, available on a monthly basis. And we still have a few copies left of the June chapel news. So the July chapel news will be coming out um, a week from Monday. So if you haven't yet read the one for June, I invite you to do so. It, it has articles about different religions. It talks about activities that are going to be happening in, in our community and in uh, chapel events. So I invite you to read that. And, and if you would like to, give me some feedback on, on, on what you read. Um, also, on Sunday afternoon and Wednesday afternoons from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, I plant myself in the San Andreas room so that anyone who happens to be walking by can pop in and we can talk and visit. Sometimes people have specific concerns that they want to talk about. Other times people stop by just to visit. Other times people have no particular concern. They just see me there and stop. Any of the above is fine. But that's every Sunday afternoon and every Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Let's continue our worship by spending a moment in silence together. Gather in awe before God, who laid the foundations of the earth. Open your hearts to the steadfast love God offers. God does not forsake us when we are dismayed and afraid. Our Creator is with us in all times and places. God is ready to listen to us in these moments together. See, now is the acceptable time, the day of salvation. Surely God will be the Oh, 
together today, I invite you to lay aside any doubt you have and fear of judgment and simply open yourself before God as we together confess to God and in the presence of one another. Let's pray together. Help us, God, for we do not have the wisdom to help ourselves when the good we have known crumbles beneath our feet and we are mired down in hopelessness and self-pity. We need you. We cannot hide from the evil that is all around us because some of it is also in us. We cry out for your saving mercy. We confess that it is easier to see the problems than the promise. We have been more ready to complain than to accept help. Oh God, we open our hearts to you. We want to be healed. listen to us. In spite of all we have done or not done, God accepts us. This is a day of salvation when brokenness is mended, problems are seen in a new light, and fierce winds are still. God does not forget the cry of the afflicted. God's affection for us is limited only by our failure to respond. Accept the gift of God's love for it is everything we need. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As your word is read and proclaimed, speak to us in the midst of our own particular needs, and let that word abide in us, 
with a transforming sense of peace that we can share with others. Give us an openness to you that we may be empowered to hear, understand, and live your word. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Samuel, chapter 17 and 18. And I invite you to listen to the word of the Lord from this reading this morning. On David's return from killing the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. When Jonathan, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. As a result, Saul set him over the army, and all the people, even the servants of Saul, approved. The next day, an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul threw the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And David marched out and came in leading the army. David had success in all his undertaking, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for it was he who marched out and came in, leading them. This is the word of the Lord.
scripture reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the second letter, chapter 6. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain, for he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. And the Gospel reading from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 4. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let's go across to the other side. So they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were also with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. Well, Jesus was in the stern asleep on the cushion. But they woke him up and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. Then Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe. And they said to one another, Who is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These readings this morning are, are, I believe, rather fascinating. Now, there is, as we know, a difference between Jesus' style of teaching and Paul's style of teaching. And we have both in the last two readings today. Jesus and Paul both taught, but they had different styles. Jesus told stories, and if you wanted to know the meaning of the story, you had to hang around for a while. Paul, however, taught theology, and personal experience. That difference 
and styles of teaching applies to the readings from Paul this morning and from the gospel. The gospel and the Old Testament reading as well, as we shall see in a moment, can be seen as history with allegorical implications. Paul simply talks about theology and personal experience. Now, if I had my choice, I'd rather listen to Jesus than Paul because it's always more pleasant to listen to stories than it is to listen to theology. But that was their difference. That's the way they taught. Now, let's look at the Old Testament reading just for a second. We know that King Saul was chosen by Samuel and the people to be king over Israel. And he was king for a time, and he was successful. Under his leadership, Israel became a nation. He led Israel to war, and they conquered their enemies. He was able to administrate and govern appropriately. For a time, Saul was very good. But apparently, God had term limits at least for Saul, and it was time for Saul to step down. But Saul did not want to step down like everybody else wants, like everybody, once you get a taste of power, you don't want to let it go. Saul had the taste of power, and he didn't want to let it go. His time had come to an end. He'd done a good job, but it was time for him to retire, but he didn't like the idea. Well, in the meantime, and probably unbeknownst to Saul, Samuel had anointed David, who was from Bethlehem. That's why he's referred to as the Bethlehemite, or his dad, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. I suppose Jesse was a major family in Bethlehem. He was probably known to most of the population, and Bethlehem was not a small town. David became famous for his ability to conquer those beyond his control. He would kill wild animals with his bare hands. Me, I would be killed. David killed wild animals with his bare hands. So when it came time for David's greatest feat, it was something seen by the entire army and by the entire nation. You know what I'm referring to. We've all heard the story of David and Goliath. Apparently, in the days when hand-to-hand -hand combat was the norm, the size of the person you're fighting was pretty significant, you know? I mean, we think in terms of warfare today, you just drop a bomb on somebody, they're all destroyed. The size of the person carrying the weapon is totally irrelevant. But in Old Testament times, the size of the person, the strength of the person mattered because it was all hand-to-hand -hand combat. You had your sword, you had your spears, but it was facing one another, face to face. Well, Goliath was pretty big. And people didn't want to face him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But David, arrogant little guy as he was, said, I will face him. And we know the story, David, faced Goliath with his slingshot. Goliath fell, made a great thud, and was killed. And David won the battle. And he became famous for that. Well, wouldn't you know that anyone who's looking for new recruits is going to recruit the guy who is able to make the giant fall? Saul recruited David to be in his army. Now, and I think this is kind of R-rated, so if kids are in the congregation, cover their ears. 
When David had killed Goliath, he took Goliath's sword and cut off Goliath's head. Why did they have to put that in there? And then he picked up Goliath's head and goes walking into the camp of Israel. And that's where the reading for the day picks up. It says David was standing there and Abner, who happened to be the general of David's of King Saul's army, saw David, knew what David had done, and brought him before leadership at that time. Now, that's the story that we're picking up on in the reading today, and that's what it's all about. Now, after David is introduced to Saul, then we have this whole reading about Jonathan. Who was Jonathan? It doesn't say in this reading, who was he? Yes, Jonathan was Saul's son. And Jonathan himself was a mighty warrior. Somehow, in this reading, we're told that Saul's son, Jonathan, and David connected became very close. Jonathan even gave David his weapons, his armor. They became very close. And that close relationship continued until the end of Jonathan's life. See, Jonathan was killed ultimately in battle. I think it was about the same time his father Saul was killed in battle. And following that, David went on to become a very successful king in Israel for about 40 years. Now, in this reading, we have King Saul becoming very distressed with his new hero. And I like the way Saul deals with it. One moment he says, this David fella is very powerful, very blessed of God. We can really use him in our armies. I just don't want to be around him because I don't like him. So he put him in charge of a thousand people. At another point, Saul is very frustrated with him and very angry, and he throws a spear at him and tries to kill him. So at one point, twice he tried to kill him. So at one point, he says, let David be a captain over a thousand people. On the other hand, it's let David be pinned to the wall. Saul wasn't in good shape. And this might be the reason why his time had come to an end. Now, I think the story of David and Saul and Goliath and the readings we have this morning are rather allegorical. They're metaphorical in the same way that the gospel reading is a metaphor this morning. The gospel reading can be seen as a metaphor. You see, Jesus told stories that were metaphorical. This biographical situation in the gospel of Mark can be seen as history with a metaphor. Now, we know that all of us have giants in our own lives, and this is the metaphor, and we all have our own Goliath who take control over everything we're about. We all have our own King Saul's that try and ignore us, put us out of their experience and existence, stand in our way of our success. We all have our inward inhibitions that we've grown up with, either because of what we've been told all our life or because of what we've experienced. I can't do that. I can't progress. I can't. I can't. We all have, to one extent or another, those things going on in our lives. Saul had his Goliath. He had his wild animals. The disciples had the storm that was overpowering them. We have storms, we have Goliaths, 
We have our own experiences that keep us down and manage to overtake and overwhelm us. In the Gospel reading, we're told that the disciples were frightened when the storm came up. And I believe their fear was totally justified. If you're in a boat and there's a storm and the boat is being filled with water and it's getting ready to sink and there's not a thing you can do about it, being scared is the appropriate response. Being afraid. Sometimes we like to badmouth the apostles because they didn't have faith. And why were you afraid? I'm suggesting that Jesus was well aware of the fact that what they were experiencing was very normal and very appropriate. I believe that when you experience fear in the presence of your own giants, in the presence of your own storms in life, when you have those kind of emotions, it's perfectly normal. I wouldn't suggest that any of us try and put away our emotional experience. I don't believe Jesus was referring to that at all. I believe in something else. Now, Jesus' response to the storm was to rebuke the wind and say to the sea, peace, be still. I believe, and this is a major oversimplification, it really is, and there's a whole lot more to it than this, but I believe connection with Christ empowers us as Christians to overcome the storms, overcome the Goliaths, and overcome the fears. Now, I, again, I think that's an oversimplification, but in the grand scheme of things, that's the way it exists. And I don't believe Jesus was telling the disciples, you shouldn't have been afraid. I believe Jesus was telling the disciples, if you just hang in there with me, you will see all of these things come together. You know, the disciples were anxious, and their anxiety affected how they responded to Jesus, and their anxiety affected their productivity. Now hear me on this one. Anxiety, in fact, arousal of any kind, decreases productivity. There have been studies done on this. If asked, I will produce them for you. Anxiety decreases productivity. Any kind of arousal, any kind of arousal will decrease your IQ anywhere from 10 to 30 points. Personally, I'm not sure I've got the 30 points to spare. I think that's one of the reasons why when someone is drowning and they get all nervous and excited, they might be a very good swimmer, but their anxiety takes them under. Not because they can't swim, but because their anxiety decreases their ability to be productive. Anytime we experience excessive anxiety, our productivity decreases. And I think sometimes we get things the other way. Sometimes we want people to be more productive. We want people to do more, to get out of our way, to move. And what do we do? We create anxiety. Hey, come on, move, work, do something. And that just creates anxiety, which will decrease the productivity, which will have a negative effect on what you're trying to do. I think in the gospel, one of the reasons Jesus was able to be productive was because he knew how to deal with his own anxiety. 
I think Jesus was simply saying that to the disciples, you know, your fear is legitimate, but your anxiety is going to decrease your ability to deal with your fear. Now, there are some who will suggest, yeah, God will solve and take care of everything. God takes care of all my problems. Therefore, problems, bring them on. I think that's crazy. I think that's one of the silliest things I've ever heard. You don't want to bring problems on. That doesn't make any sense. No. Problems are bad. They're difficult. They're hard. It isn't, let me experience problems. Rather, it's when I do experience problems, I trust that God will deal with it for me. Now, in the writings of St. Paul to the Corinthians, he, as his style is, simply lays out personal experience talking about all these negative things. He talks about great endurance and afflictions, calamities, hardships, beatings, etc. Being hungry. You know, so he just kind of lays out the things in very blatant talk that the gospel and the Old Testament were talking about allegorically in the creation of their metaphor. So metaphorically over here, blatantly over here, but it's the same thing. When these things happen for us and to us, there's got to be a way out of it. And that way out of it is through our faith, our belief in the one who is able to conquer these things and take care of them for us. Our way out of our situations is never through our increased anxiety and imposed on others kind of anxiety. That will not make it happen. And finally, I think it's very important in these readings for us to understand that focus always has an impact on the result. Always. Focus always has an impact on the result. In the Old Testament reading, King Saul was focused on David and what David was doing and how that affected him. In the Gospel reading, the disciples were focused on the storm and how that was having a negative effect on who they are, and it also had an effect on how they responded to Jesus. Just parenthetically, and maybe you identify with this, when the disciples were having a problem, and they were scared, and they were focused on the storm, and their own weakness and inability to conquer the storm, when they approached Jesus, it was, What's the matter? Don't you care? I think, and this is just looking back at the story, I think a more appropriate response on their part, and if they had been less anxious and better focused, I think a better response would have been, teacher, we're having a hard time here. Can you help us? Of course, they didn't think that way, but the reason they didn't was because of their focus. They were focused on what's going on for them as opposed to how to get out of the problem. I believe we do the same thing very often. Our focus, rather than being on how do we conquer this thing, our focus is on all these other people around here who should be helping us and they're not. What's the matter with you? As opposed to, hey, I'm having a difficult situation here. Can you help me? Your focus has a lot to do with your response and how you deal with the situation. In the writings of St. Paul, he talks about all the bad things that he's going through. And then he says, we manage to conquer those things because of our focus. He doesn't use those words, but I believe that's what he means. He talks about all the bad things, and then he talks about his focus in purity, in power of God, in patience, in 
etc. All of those good things he focused on. And that's what helped them make it through. I think the same is true for us. Our focus will enhance our ability to deal with things that arise. Focus on your faith. That's what Jesus said. Focus on the good stuff that's happening, the power of God. That's what Paul said. And in the story of David and Saul, focus on things that bring peace. Focus on the will of God as opposed to having my own way. Let's pray. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for calling us to be your people. Empower us to receive from you all that you would have us to receive, that we might be the people you have called us to be. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. This song is maybe a new one for us here. Uh, if you know it, please sing along. Into hell. On the third day, 
he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Continue praying for the families of Mary Nadal and Jean Boyle. Let's remember those families in prayer as, as they're experiencing what they're experiencing at this time. And if you have personal concerns of your own that you would like to have as part of this prayer, I invite you to be thinking about those as we pray. And let your concerns, your thoughts, be included in this prayer that we pray together. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you for being our God. And we thank you, God, for calling us to be your people, for creating in us the desire for and the ability to worship and follow you, God. We ask that you will give us power over things in our own lives that rise up, our own storms, our own giants, our own bad experiences, our own troubles. We ask, God, that you will empower us to have power over them. We ask that you will help our focus to be in line with things that conquer those things as opposed to things that give those things power. Help us, God, to decrease our own anxiety by our faith and our trust in you rather than allowing our anxiety to control us. We ask for these things, Lord, knowing that through you, we have the capacity to experience them. We pray for our world, God. We ask that you will bring peace to our world and help us, God, to be peacemakers. We pray for our community. We ask that you will give our leaders wisdom in that decisions they make will benefit the entire community, allowing us to live life in Christ and in joy. We pray, God, that you will empower us to be present for one another as we experience and see the needs that each one has. We ask, God, that you will comfort those who are grieving a loss. We ask that you will empower those who need a touch from you. We pray, God, that you will empower us to be present for one another as you have been empowering us to do within the life of this community. We thank you, God, that you have called us to be your people, that you have called us to be here, and that you are indeed our God. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 